Good morning, Pathway Community Church. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you all that are here um, in the church and as well as those online. Uh, we're going to be starting off with worship as usual, and um, we'll be doing uh, the song at the cross as well as uh, Great Are You Lord. Uh, so they should be a bit familiar since we've done it before, and, um, and you can also follow the lyrics if you don't know it. So let's go ahead and start with at the cross. There's a place, if there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies, and there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the love I'm in awe of you, I'm in awe of you, and where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, Jesus. song 
song we'll be doing is Great Are You, Lord.
just give thanks to the Lord that he has given us life and that he has given us our breath and that we get to praise him uh, with all of our hearts. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and start with announcements. And um, so yeah, just welcome everybody. Welcome for those of you that are here in the church as well as those of you that are at home. Um, um, for those of you that are at home, uh, we would I'd love for you to say hi in the chat, um, and just, um, yeah, say hi and just let everyone know how you're doing. Uh, make sure to check in and just let us know how you're doing and how we can also pray for you um, for this coming week. Um, May sermon series, so uh, we have come to the end of our restart um, sermon series, and Pastor David will be closing uh, today with that sermon about um, reaching people in different contexts. So that's what we're going to be going through today. And um, for next month, we will have a new series called The Encouragement um, Project. And our focus will be on how we can serve to strengthen, um, how we can serve to, sorry, how we can serve, how we can serve, how we can strengthen and also encourage one another, uh, those of you that are in the body of faith. Uh, and even as we receive encouragement as well from God's word. Um, so we hope also um, to have some practical applications. Um, so if you have any ideas on how we can serve to encourage and, and to serve others in this coming month, please feel free uh, to speak to Pastor David and make sure also to invite your friends and family um, for this coming month as well. Also, um, this is our, our time of giving as well. And we continue to be thankful to God for all that he's done for this church, all that he's provided. Um, and, and we also wanted to um, thank um, Redwood Glen as well um, for, for um, all that they've done with their ministry. And so we, we wanted to just be uh, a blessing to them as well as they've been a blessing to us uh, through giving. And like as, as Melissa has mentioned last week, how uh, the camp has gone through um, some challenges over the past year. And we would like to stand with them uh, because we have been greatly blessed by their ministry and as a church. Uh, you can give by uh, designating a check to Redwood Glen or you clicking on the Redwood Glen fund on our giving link as well. Um, so thank you and God bless you. Uh, we're going to be playing another video on the um, prayer for the Muslims. Um, so that will be next. My name is Diane. I was born and raised in a Muslim family. I was taught to believe and recite the Shahada as God's truth. I believe then that the Islamic prophet Muhammad was God's messenger. However, God's precious Holy Spirit graciously opened my eyes to the truth of the Bible, His Holy Word. I now passionately follow Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord. Please pray with me now for Muslims that as they recite the Shahada, they would be interrupted by the Spirit of God and encounter Jesus and the truth of who He is. Dear God, many Muslims are desperately trying to please You and reach You. They diligently express their religious devotion in numerous ways while striving within themselves to live disciplined lives in hope of obtaining Your favor and grace. They live sacrificially in their earnest desire to please You and in hope of being with You in paradise when they depart from this earth. They've been taught to believe in the Qur'an as God's word and the reciting of the Shahada as a required statement of their faith. They're under the false deception that declaring the Shahada is pleasing to you. We pray, Lord, for their eyes to be open to the truth that the Bible is the inspired word of God that was written centuries before the Qur'an. And your Bible warns us by stating that even if an angel from heaven comes and preaches any other gospel, let them be cursed forever. The Bible also warns that the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. Dear Heavenly Father, help the Muslim people to see the deception of Satan. Help them to make the connection regarding the origins of 
the Quran that Muhammad founded Islam after being visited by an angel who gave him a different message than what you already gave in your Bible. Dear God, please help the Muslim people to see that reciting the Shahada doesn't open a door to you, but it places them on an opposite and dark path that you never intended. The Bible tells us that the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the eyes of unbelievers, those who don't believe in Christ, the Savior of the world. Father God, we pray in Jesus' name that the blinders be lifted from the eyes of unbelievers and that they would come to know your truth and the love through the sacrifice of Jesus who died on the cross for their sin, that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You are a God of love sacrifice and humility and you humbled yourself and came to this earth to take upon yourself the sin of the world that we could receive forgiveness and have eternal life only a righteous holy god without blemish could become our perfect sacrifice and pay the debt for our sin we pray that every muslim would come to know this that they would humble themselves before you god almighty and receive forgiveness of their sin through the sacrificial death and miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' holy name, amen. Uh, amen. Um, and so we're, we're going to sing one more song. Um, and w with that in mind, with the, the prayer uh, requests that we have here, of praying for the Muslims, uh, that we sing this last song. Um, uh, these are just the lyrics of it. It just says, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. Uh, so as we sing this last song, if we could just uh, pray with the heart of um, desiring that they would know the Lord the way that we, we know the Lord as well. Um, so yeah, um, if, we could, if we could all stand if you're able and we can sing this last song.
so precious to us, Lord. Uh, you're more precious than all, all the silver, all the gold, all the diamonds in the whole world, Lord. Uh, that even though man um, loves these things, Lord, that you are even beyond that, Lord. You're beyond um, all of the universe, Lord, that you created, God. And, and we, so we praise you, God, for all that you are, God, mm -hmm. and how, how great that you are, God. Uh, we thank you, Lord, um, for, for the opportunity, Lord, to be able to preach um, and, and evangelize, Lord, your word and, your, um, and who you are to all those that are, are lost and that don't know about you, God. And so we pray, God, that, um, that we would just be able to be bold enough to, to speak about who you are, God, and how precious you are to us, God. Help our testimonies, Lord, uh, be a light to the world, Lord, uh, to these Muslim communities, Lord. Um, and even as um, there are many Muslims here, Lord, um, in Fremont and in the Bay Area, God. Mm -hmm. So I, I pray, God, that uh, you would just give us that strength and that your Holy Spirit would be with us as we do so. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Great to see all of you here. Can, can we give a wave to each other for those of you who are in the building? And, you know, we have all these constraints as far as no post-service food and all of that. And we have the mask, but we are glad to see each other. I think we can still greet each other like that. And, and it is great to see you. And welcome to all of you who are online as well. And it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Javier, for giving our announcements today and, and leading our worship. We do appreciate that. And it's just, yeah, great to have the, the, the team together. And I had an opportunity yesterday to do something I've been waiting for, and I got, to do, I got the first uh, COVID vaccine shot yesterday. And so we went to a, a clinic in uh, Hayward and got it there. So I'm glad to be moving towards immunization and really grateful that it is expanded to all, everyone above 16. And, um, and just, I was just reflecting yesterday about all the work that went into making that possible. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of effort for the people to develop it and distribute it and administer it. I mean, just a lot of work all the way around. And it's encouraging, I, I think, to see where we're at at this point in the pandemic, to see the numbers improving. And I do hope and pray we can move out of this soon. And hopefully by June, July, maybe a little bit back to, to normal if all goes well. But it also, you know, it's also very disheartening to see what's happening around the world in India and Kenya and other places that are very much in the, the ravages of, of the pandemic. So I continue to, to pray for them. So as Javier mentioned, we're finishing Restart today. We've been eight weeks going through Acts. And obviously it could be a lot more. I mean, there's, we only did little bits and pieces. We're only making it up to chapter 17 is where we're going to finish today. And there's, you know, all the way up to chapter 28. So there's a whole lot we did not touch on. But we've just been reflecting as we go through, as we've gone through the last two months, on what God did in the early church and what God continues to do as we move forward today. And I had, I had alluded at the beginning of the series about the periods of disruption that happen about every 500 years in church history up until now and how we're going through a period of disruption now. And then we tend to see, we tend to see some things that, that kind of you know, are, are let go and that pass away in that time, but new things that, that give birth and that come up. And that's, that's one of the periods that we're at. So we've seen a lot over the last few months. We started in chapter 1 with the giving of the Holy Spirit and how Jesus told them they would receive the Spirit and be his witnesses uh, throughout Judea and Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We saw how the, how the Spirit came at Pentecost in chapter 2 and, and what that means for us, how we can reach people in their language is something we looked at. We've seen how the gospel reached the Ethiopian eunuch and how the gospel reached the Roman centurion and reached Cornelius. And the work that God did in, in uh, Peter and in Paul and in others to help them see that the gospel is going out beyond ethnic boundaries to reach every part of the world. We, we looked at uh, overcoming spiritual opposition. Last week we looked at the Macedonian call. 
and how Paul and, and his group was called to go into that area. And, and we talked about God's calling for us today. And so now we've made it up to Acts 17, and this will be our final passage for this particular series. So please turn with me if you do have a Bible. I'm going to read from verse 16 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 34. And it says this, Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he, has sent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. When, when BG and I were on our honeymoon, we had the chance to spend one day in Athens, and we went to where this happened. We went to, in English it's translated, Mars Hill. And, and just being able to, to walk that place and, and climb up, and we, we took some pictures there, but being able to see where Aristotle and Plato and Paul and, and other and, and, and other figures from, from history had been, was just really a, a special experience. And I had you know, read a fair amount about Greece, and it was really cool to see it. Although from that experience, BG always says that she thought we were on a romantic getaway for our honeymoon, <laughs> and that you know, I was doing like a, a missionary trip. We got to visit about four or five, about four places that Paul had gone on our honeymoon, did like a reverse Pauline journey. And, um, but th there was romance there as well. But, but that was one experience we had. And so when, when Paul was there, he, he was waiting for, um, for Silas and Timothy to, to catch up with him. Right before this, they'd gone through Thessalonica and Berea. And he's waiting for them to join him. So he's there, and we're told he's disturbed by the, the level of idolatry, all the idols and, and, and how they would worship. So that bothers him. And so he goes to the synagogue. And he goes to the marketplace and he debates in both places and shares the message he always has, Jesus and the resurrection. 
And so people heard about it, and he attracted their interest, and so then they invited him to come to the Areopagus, to Mars Hill, to defend himself, to, to explain himself. And it helps to understand a bit of, of what happened there. So this was the seat of a venerable council of elders, which was named after the hill. So there's a hill, which is a physical location, but there's also the elders, the, the court that, that met there. And so this was the Supreme Court of Athens. So it was a law court, but they also would listen to other stuff. I mean, they would also you know, entertain new ideas, as we're told in the passage. It, it's possible one of the reasons for Paul's speech was to decide if his God merited a new space in, in the city. And so if they wanted to make you know, a, new, a new shrine, that they would have people audition you know, and, and explain, well, why should we put this one up? So that may have been part of what they were interested in. And so this setting of Mars Hill is very different. It sets it apart from all the rest of Acts, but most of the rest of, of Acts. Almost in every other setting, Paul, he generally begins in the synagogue. And that's where he begins. He begins with, with the Jews and with the, the system of Jewish worship, which was now undergoing change as it became Christian worship. But here is a completely secular setting. And so he's not talking to Jews. He's not talking to people that have a background of Jewish faith, that understand the Hebrew Scriptures. And so he's in a very different context. And we see that Paul had a very different approach. The message he gives in that setting was very different than all the other sermons we have in Acts, which were, which were generally to a Jewish audience. So he does not quote from the Old Testament. He does not start with the story of Israel, as he generally did, and end with the coming of the Messiah, as the Jews were expecting. And so I've called this message different strokes to, to get at the idea that, that we need to have that adaptability so that when we're in a new setting, we can, we can reach people in that particular context and to be able to adjust what we're saying to reach the people that we are with. And there's five lessons that, that, that I've seen going through this that I want to share with you this morning. And here's the first one about how we can share our faith with people of a different religious background in, a, say, a secular, a non-Christian context. Number one, to begin with what we have in common. To begin with what you have in common. And so the first thing Paul says, he says that they're very religious. And so that's a point of connection. Paul was also very religious. Now this may not have been just a compliment. I mean, he may have been, you know, he, the connotation may have been more, you're very superstitious, <laughs> might have been what he's saying. And so it, it, he wasn't really trying to butter them up. In fact, that was actually one of the official rules of speaking to this court, is you couldn't flatter them. And so most likely he wasn't just, you know, trying to, to talk them up, but he, he was establishing a point of connection. They both believed in religion, and they both valued it highly. Now, how they did it was pretty different. And so we have to develop these points of contact, the points of connection. And pretty much anyone you meet, I think no matter where you go, you're going to have some point of connection with them. And so it's figuring out what do we have in common? What are the things we're both interested in? What do we both like? You know, what do you value? And how can that be an avenue, an on-road to share the gospel? One, one of the, the techniques that Paul develops here is, is narrative theology. And so he's, he's using, he's beginning with creation. He's not telling the same way he did to, the, to, to a Hebrew context, but he does begin with creation and then talks about the, the, the development of all the nations, how the nations came to be, and then how God is, um, is still demanding repentance in light of the day of judgment. So he's connecting them to the overall story of God and showing how they fit into God's story, which is something that, that we're also always able to do. And, and so reaching people out, outside of the church, as we all know, is, is very difficult. I mean, sometimes it can be just reach, making that first point of contact. I mean, meeting them, finding them can be the most difficult part. But even once we have the opportunity, knowing what to say and so on is, can be quite a challenge. And I find it interesting in, the, in this context that Paul was invited to speak. He wasn't intruding. He didn't crash you know, their event and say, I have to say something. Now, given Paul, I mean, he might have done that if he felt it was necessary because he was pretty bold. But he was invited to speak. And so he was following their protocols when he went and addressed them. So if, whenever possible, if we can be invited to share, it's much more effective when that happens. Now, of course, you know, as, as, as just regular people who are not traveling evangelists, you're probably not going to be invited to speak to, you know, a local assembly, most likely. But for us, it probably looks more like just getting to know the people around us, our neighbors and so on, so that they will invite us to share the hope we have in us. And so that they know us enough so that they know what we value and, and, and so on. And so it begins with the relationship. Yeah, so we need to begin with what we have in common. 
And then secondly is to know your context. To know your context. So we begin with what we have in common. But even knowing what we have in common, you have to know someone before you can establish that. So we need to know our context, to know how we're operating, what's going on in the setting that we're in. Earlier in Restart, I talked about the process of contextualization in one of the earlier messages. The process of studying intentionally the, the context we're in, learning the history, the background, the values, and, and so on. And then using that as a way to then take the gospel and to put it in, in, in words that make sense in that setting. And so in, in Paul's example, what we see here, he used illustrations that were taken from, from philosophy and philosophical concepts, quoted directly from their own thinkers. And so Paul knew who, who the major Greek thinkers were, and he was able to use their own ideas to then present his message. So he quoted from, well, there are two groups that are highlighted here. There's the Epicureans and there's the Stoics. And the Epicureans generally um, focused on pleasure. They believed that pleasure was the highest value of human life. And this was not just partying and getting drunk and all that. It was, it was stable pleasures, pleasure that was uh, lasting and so on. And, and so they had a whole philosophy. How do you achieve pleasure? How do you avoid pain? And how do you maximize it and make it last? So that's what their philosophy was about. Stoics are focused differently on, on morality and on duty, to just summarize very briefly. And so Paul was able to, to, to use their thought. He quoted from um, Epimenides, was, was one of the people he quoted from. But he's able to use their thought and to explain the gospel with that. In some other places in the Bible, Paul warns against philosophy. And, and let me read one place where he does that. When he writes to the Colossian church, he says this. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. So he's giving a warning there about how they understand and use philosophy and to avoid being taken captive by it. Now, sometimes that passage and others have been taken to mean that Christians shouldn't have anything to do with philosophy. And, and, and that's something that, that, that I've heard before, that we shouldn't learn it, we shouldn't know it, we shouldn't read it, and that it's just not something we should do at all. But clearly, that's not what Paul meant, because Paul did know philosophy. And he had read their philosophers, he knew enough to be able to look through their thought and to pick out the pieces that would fit into the message he was trying to convey. So not all philosophy is hollow and deceptive. Notice that he quantifies it. He says, don't be held captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy. So it's not all philosophy, but some that he views as particularly dangerous. For a while when I was in Nairobi, I used to teach a course at a mission called, called Introduction to Philosophy. And so we, we would read little bits of Aristotle and Plato and Kierkegaard and some other African philosophers as well. And, this was for, and they were all church leaders. They were all pastors and, and people getting a, um, a diploma in, in missions who were taking the class. And so some of them had a lot of trouble with that. <laughs> and so I, you know, I, there are people who really didn't see the value, like, why are we doing this? What is the point? And so on. But I do think that there's value in knowing some of those backgrounds that do shape our, our worldview and, and the setting and the context that we live in. And I don't think it's necessary for all of us to do that. I don't think we all need to be experts in, in that field. We, we, we can't all be experts in every field, obviously. But I do think there's value in knowing some of the basics and for some of us to go deep and to get into that. And that's something that personally I have enjoyed the chance to do. And I think it's important for us today to have at least an overview of postmodern philosophy, what postmodern philosophy means, what it involves, and how it shapes the, the assumptions that go into our legal system, our educational system, and so many other systems that we operate in today. Now, I think some of it is, is positive, some of it is, is very negative, but I think it's understanding, first of all, so that we can critique and evaluate and respond when these things come up. And I remember when I used to do street evangelism in Chicago, and this was in like 2004, 2005. And this was right after the novel The Da Vinci Code was published. And that novel came out in 2003. And I, I read it. I read it when it came out. And I thought it was compelling as a story. I mean, it was, I thought it was a page turner. I thought it was fairly well written. So I read it. Now, in terms of history, I also thought it was somewhat compelling in a way, but highly inaccurate and misleading and, and so on in terms of the way it presents um, the, the history of Jesus Christ, how the church came to view him as, as divine, and, and so on. So it, it's highly inaccurate in, in terms of what it presents, but it presents it in a very compelling and intriguing way. And I remember talking to people 
And, you know, generally we'd begin by asking them, you know, is there any way we can pray for you? That was usually our intro. And depending on how they responded, the conversation would go from there. But I just remember talking to people, and it was so clear to me <laughs> that they had read the novel, just based on all the things they would say. And so I would ask them, and I'd say, hey, have, have you read The Da Vinci Code? And meant several times, I remember, they had. And so just having that shared point of connection was helpful to then engage and said, yeah, I read it too. I think there's some parts, you know, that, that maybe I'd agree with. But these are the parts where I think the novel got it wrong and where I don't think it's quite accurate. But it played a deep role in influencing how people view Jesus, how people view the church, and, and how the church came up with its doctrines. And so I believe that Paul's use of philosophy here should be enough to retire the notion that philosophy has no value. And obviously not, not all of it is correct. Much of it isn't. It's not salvific. But I do think it's very effective in reaching people. And I think one of the most effective ways to reach people through philosophy is to put it into a narrative context. So like, like write a novel or make a movie, you know, like a space drama, like Star Wars that has a lot of philosophy in there. And so you're going to reach a lot more people that way than just by writing a, you know, a philosophy textbook or something else. But, but that's how we get a lot of the, the philosophy we know is, is through means like that. And so for us, I think just in reaching our context, we need to know what people are thinking, what, what's informing them, and, and how they're operating today. And so it's these paradigms that really shape them. I mean, personally, I, haven't been, I have not spent a lot of time studying Buddhist thought or Hindu thought. So there's some of those systems that I'm not super familiar with, but that in, in, in our context today can be very helpful to know. And that's one that I hope I can read up on a little bit more. When, when we got our vaccine yesterday, it was at a Sikh temple. And so they just gave space to a, to a clinic. And so they were, they were you know, sitting in tables and tents outside. And um, then afterwards, we kind of hung around for a little bit. And they were extraordinarily welcoming. So they gave us lunch. They gave us chai. They gave us cookies. Gave me a whole tour of the place. You know, and they really took time to show us around. But I was, I was really struck by, um, well, by their community focus. But he also shared a little bit about their views. And he said that you know, they believe in one God. They don't, they don't do idol worship, you know, in, in, in his view. And um, I, I'm not super familiar with Sikh thought. And it was just it was interesting to hear from his perspective, you know, what they, what they do, what they believe, and to just get a little bit more of that understanding. And um, yeah, so I think for us, it's knowing our context that can make such a difference in building connections and in reaching people for Jesus. The third one is this. Once we know our context, once we begin with what they have in common, to answer a question they have to answer a question they have. It's obviously much more effective when you're talking to someone to tell them something they're interested in or something they're wondering than something that they do not find of value or relevance to their, to their life. And so Paul notes that he saw an altar to an unknown God, and he uses that as an opening. And so he's saying, you're worshiping a God that you don't understand, that you don't know who it is, and I'm here to clarify that concept. I'm here to explain the, the God that you believe that you're worshiping. So he used that as his opening. Now, he is clear in saying that he doesn't think they're correct in their understanding, but, but, but he's using that to answer their question. I mean, obviously, all of us have the question of purpose, the question of what is the significance of our life? What am I here for? What am I meant to be? You know, why, why am I here? And there's a question of, yeah, of, of significance and value that goes, that goes into that. For some of us, when we, um, when we go through seasons like this, there's a question of how do I find hope in this kind of a season? How do I deal with the stress and anxiety that I have? And that's one question a lot of people are, are struggling with. There are people who are asking, why should I go on? I mean, what, what's the value of my life right now? And they're really wondering, and, and people who are at the brink of taking their own life that are wondering, well, what is this about? What's the purpose here? And others who are struggling with relationship issues of how do I make a relationship work? How do I fix my marriage? How do I fix my relationship with my kids? or, or with, my, with my, um, my friends, or whoever. And so knowing the right question to answer is really key. And the reality is a lot of people around us are not living in a state of spiritual crisis. They're not always, you know, in a state of existential wondering, is there a God, and how do I worship Him, what does that look like? That's probably not the question foremost on their minds. But it's getting to know them and connecting with them so that we can realize, what are the things you're looking for, and how can Jesus be the answer to that? I think it also requires humility that we don't come across as just having all the answers, that we've figured it all out, that we know everything, we've got it all figured out. And sometimes Christians have that um, kind of portrayal, and sometimes Christians are, are viewed that way. But it's recognizing that we don't have all the answers. We can point people to the source of them and to the source of truth. The fourth lesson I believe we can learn from, from Paul and in his speech here in, in Athens is to correct misconceptions to correct the misconceptions that people have. 
And, and so the, the philosophers, when Paul came in, they didn't think much of what Paul was saying. They called him a, a babbler. Literally, that means a seed picker, like a loafer, a worthless person. So I saw him as this guy who just kind of wanders around. He hears of something interesting here. He hears something interesting there. And then he goes to a new place and tries to sell himself as the authority. You know, I've, I've gotten all this info. But they didn't think much of his system. They, they didn't think he had a very coherent worldview. or They, they, they didn't think he, he had much value to say. And so when he comes to speak, he he's, he's already has to overcome that assumption they have about him, that he's just babbling whatever. And so they do give him an audience, they give him the benefit of a doubt, and they think it's worth hearing, but he has to present that he does have a worldview that's informed. He does have a basis to stand on. He's thought through what he believes, and he knows why, and he knows how to make it in a clear and coherent way. And he corrects some of the aspects of their worldview that are false. So the Greeks, at that time, they believed in their own cultural and ethnic superiority. They believed it because they came from the soil they lived on. They hadn't immigrated from another place outside of the area. They're one of the few in that region who hadn't come in, and they had a longer heritage in that particular place. They believed that they were therefore ethnically in, uh, superior to everyone else, superior to the Gentiles or to the Jews or to any other non-Greek group. And so Paul rejects this by pointing out that people have one common origin, that from one man, God made all the nations. So that's undermining their claim of having a unique history and a unique value based on their history. So we are all created by God. He says this in, um, in verse 26. He says, From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So all of us are created by God. We're all made in God's image, which is why we don't have racial hierarchies. We don't have um, that, that type of nation that's set above other nations, and that's what Paul is saying. And, and I think we can use that today when we combat you know, the, the, the ideas of white supremacy and the, the, the hatred and the, some of the racially-based attacks that we've been seeing in the news and in other places, which are, which are very unfortunate and that undermine this, this view. So relativism is the idea that, that all of us have our own truth, the idea that all of us have our, our own way of, our own perspective, but that, that means that there's no truth that cuts across to all of us. And that's a, it really permeates our postmodern um, context. And that can really shut down whatever you want to say if someone believes uh, deeply in that view. Because, and I've had this experience where I'll talk to someone and they'll agree with everything I say. And like, absolutely, I believe that, that, you know, that, that God made the world. I believe that Jesus came, that he died. That's true, but it's true for you. It's not true for me. And so they, they don't disagree with anything that I said, but they don't see how it has any context or any applicability to their own life. And when someone believes that, that is a very difficult thing to overcome. But I think what, what Paul's doing here, he's seeking to establish universal relevance and universal um, applicability to what he's saying. So since God is in control over all of us, he's set our boundaries and he's appointed our times and seasons, then that means that all of us has the same imperative of repentance because we all face the same judgment is what Paul is saying. So that, that won't convince everyone. I mean, if you really do believe in a thoroughgoing relativism, then you know, just saying that will not necessarily change your mind. But I think that's the kind of foundation that will, that will help you to, to reach people in that type of, of uh, mindset. So Paul doesn't just equate uh, his understanding with God with their prior worship. So he doesn't just come in and say, you know, you've, you've been worshiping God, but you, know, you just need to know his name or, or something like that. He, he actually goes deeper. And so he uses that as a starting point to explain that God's power is, is what leads to God's authority over us, that it's God we are accountable to. Well, one of the quotes that he makes is from the philosopher um, Ar Aratus, who wrote this. He, he said this, he said, All ways are full of Zeus, and all meeting places of men. The sea and all the harbors are full of him. In every direction, we all have to do with Zeus, for we are also his offspring. So Paul only quotes the very last bit. He only quotes the very last bit. Now, clearly, Paul does not believe that we all come from Zeus. He, he doesn't believe that. So he's taking that view, even though he doesn't believe with the assumption, he's taking one little piece of it, but he's using that to, to clarify that it's actually God who, who we are descended from, and it's God who, who we are the offspring of. And so he's taking their view, but, but he's, 
he's correcting what he sees as the, as the shortcomings and, and, and what he doesn't believe is correct. And so that, that, that brings you to, to, to the final lesson from this particular passage, which is lead to Jesus. And so I think we should start with what we have in common, but that we should end with Jesus and end with what Jesus has done for us. I think sometimes we can, we can be very effective in establishing rapport, getting to know people, building friendships, getting that connection, but we don't really lead them anywhere. We, we don't end up sharing all that much of significance. So that, that can be the challenge. Sometimes this part is one of the hardest ones to do. And so in calling people to repent, he's saying your current approach to religion, your current approach to worship is not sufficient, but you need to change. So they need to make a U-turn. You need to turn away from your current view and, and turn to the resurrected Christ. So, so given how short this is, I think it's, I, there are some who will, who will look at this speech and say because Paul, for example, did not say the name of Jesus inside this speech, that, that he, he, didn't, he didn't talk about Jesus. Now the word Jesus does not appear in, in what he said, but there's only 14 sentences in this speech. It takes about a minute and a half to read. That's really short. And that's a really short sermon. It'd be a really short TED Talk. A TED Talk is what? About what? 20 minutes? 15 to 20 minutes? That would be really short. So I think it's highly unlikely that Paul said the one minute and a half that we have recorded here and then stopped. It it is possible, but I think more likely he he shared more before he finished, but then Luke edited it and abbreviated the main points in what we have written down in our account. So I think that it's very possible that he did invoke the name of Jesus, even though there's some debate about that. He clearly references Jesus at the end, because he says, God will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of, proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And so even if he doesn't use the word, which is not included in that particular, that particular sentence, he, he definitely alludes to the idea. And he is talking about Jesus, the person, and, um, and how Jesus raised from the dead. So repentance, the death and resurrection of Christ, they're non-negotiable in our, in our presentation. And they're just as controversial and problematic now as they were then. People were just as like, I mean, the, the people were offended when he said it at the end. And, and a lot of them, you know, they, they, they rejected what, what he said. Let me just look again at how, at, at how it's, it's written. I mean, they said, yeah, some of them sneered, right? <laughs> but others said, we want to hear you again. And so there's only a few who became followers. There are people who will look at this and say it's one of Paul's least effective missionary encounters. There's no record of a church that he started in Athens. There's only a few converts he had. So I, I think we can still look at this as, as a, a thing we can learn from as opposed to a failure. But it may have been a more difficult context than Paul's usual setting in the other cities and places he went to. But Paul was clear in what he communicated. And I think he was gracious, and I, and I think he was loving in presenting to them, this is what I believe, and this is what I want to present to you when he had the audience. So this is what we've seen today. To begin with what we have in common, to start with that, to know your context as as we share and and, and in what we have to say, to answer a question people have, to correct misconceptions, and then to lead to Jesus. And this is what I see Paul doing, and I hope that we can do the same when we have these types of of opportunities. I I read a quote this week from the, the missionary David Livingston, who had traveled all over, especially Africa, in places and, and discovered you know, places that, that, that um, were previously unknown by, um, by, by the British and, and the outsiders. And so he was once asked, where are you prepared to go? And so he, told, he answered, he said, I'm prepared to go anywhere as long as it is forward. And I've just been reflecting about us as a church, and I don't know exactly where the future will take us. I don't know what the rest of this year and the years to come will look like in terms of our ministries, in terms of the changes that that will be maybe kind of imposed upon us, the changes that we choose to make. But my prayer, my desire is that it would be forward. And I believe that God is leading us forward. But I don't know exactly what that is. And there is a lot of unknowns as you look ahead. But I do think there's a great, there's amazing potential in what God is doing around us and what God is doing here. And, and, and that's the hope that we have. I think it's the hope we have from Acts and the hope we continue to have in what God is doing. As Javier had mentioned, we're, we're moving to a different sermon series next week. And so I've just been reflecting on where people are at, and I think many of us are discouraged. And I, I think for some of us, you know, when, when, we get so, when we get so maybe caught up in our own kind of anxieties and the struggles that we face, it can be hard to focus on mission. I know this is, we were pretty focused on mission the last two months. 
But I want us to focus more on what are the promises and the truths of the Bible that, that encourage us, and how can we share that encouragement with each other? Because that's really our fuel for mission. I believe it's the joy we have in Christ. It's our understanding of what God has promised us and what God is doing for us. So I hope as we go through May that it would be a source of encouragement for us, looking at different passages that that can lift us up, that that can unite us as a church. We'll have a Mother's Day celebration in a few weeks. I I know there are some who, you know, are are hoping to, to rejoin us in person as we go through the next several weeks. But I do pray that God would lift up our hearts and that we can focus intentionally. How can we encourage each other? And how can we rely on the foundation of God to to be encouraged as we move ahead? And and that'll be our our major focus in the the weeks to come. And so I'm excited about that. And we'll we'll see how that all comes together. So I'll ask if you can stand with me as I I pray. And I'm just going to close this this series and our, our time together. And so please pray with me. Dear Lord, I do thank you for today. I thank you for the chance to be here, for the chance to reflect on what what you did in Athens all those years ago, on the words that Paul shared, the concepts that he used, even his own understanding of the philosophy of that time. And I pray that we can be cognizant, that we can be aware of our context, of, of some of the major philosophies or other worldviews that influence the people around us, and that we'd approach them with love and with care and about sharing them. This is the hope that I have for eternity, and I, my desire is to share it with you. So I pray that we can live out this example, that you can set up divine appointments and opportunities for us to be your light and to share this message. I pray that as we go through this week, that you would open these doors, O oh Lord, and that we'd have the courage to step through them, even when there is something unknown. I pray that as we restart and as we continue to to reflect on on what are the most, what are our biggest priorities in this season of ministry. That we can maximize the resources and the time that we have in order to pursue your mission, O God, that you have given to us. So I pray that you lift up our hearts today, give us your strength, give us your joy, and continue to renew our minds, to renew our hearts. That we be filled with love for you and appreciation for your grace and your peace in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we close, I just want to share two Two final verses, and one is from the beginning of Acts, and one is from the end of Matthew. And this is what Jesus said when he spoke to the disciples. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And for all of us who have made the decision of accepting Christ and received the Holy Spirit, that continues to be God's desire for us and, and what God sees our role being. And then finally, in Matthew 28, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Spirit and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I hope that can continue to be our drumbeat as a church, our our mission and our mandate. In all that we do, we'd make disciples, get to know people, and walk with them as we follow Christ. So I wish you a wonderful week. I'll I'll dismiss us to, yeah, spend some time outside. And I wish you all a wonderful Sunday and a good week. So take care.